first, let's check in with child psychologist Claire Rowe now, who's been a regular on my programs. It's always been great to get your insights, uh, Claire. We've talked a lot about uh, children and the fear and worries over climate change. Gee, now they've got something real and immediate to worry about. Um, uh, what should parents be doing in, in, in terms of sharing the news? I'm, let's start with little children, t t children, you know, 12 and under, I suppose. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, yes, what happened to climate change anxiety? Yes. Uh, everyone's talking corona now. So, um, look, I think first and foremost, we have to manage our own anxiety. It is not necessarily what we're saying to children. It's how we're saying that it's the tone of voice and it's our behaviour. So all of this stockpiling behaviour and uh, is what is going to make our and children anxious. Uh, I, I would say for children under the age of, say, six, uh, if they haven't had any knowledge about this virus, I don't see it necessary to talk to them about it. You're only going to induce unnecessary anxiety. Um, obviously, for children of school age and above, they will have heard about it. And, and this is where we're in new parenting, parenting territory, really, because um, you, it's out of your hands as parents whether they're going to get information or not because it's impacting their lives. I mean, they're... Their football is now cancelled, their swimming lessons are cancelled and, and their lives are being affected. So, um, look, I always tell parents to find out what children know first. Uh, ask them some questions. You must know about the coronavirus. What are people saying at school? Uh, how do you feel about it? So look, start with that first. And then use very non-emotive, non-panicking language, uh, very matter-of-fact. Um, and we can say things like, yes, people are concerned they won't have enough food at home, but we've got plenty. Uh, that type of matter-of-fact language to let our children know that they are safe and we are doing all we can to, to protect them. Now, the facts here are really comforting for children and presumably we should share that information with children. While we need to tell them to wash their hands and keep social distance and do all those things, it's surely reassuring to be able to tell them that, that children tend not to get infected and certainly tend not to uh, suffer badly from illness if they are. Oh, absolutely. And that would be my first kind of point of fact when I've got a child who responds when asking them what they know about it, that, yes, we're all going to die. Well, hang on a second. Um, yeah, at, the, at the moment, children seem to be fairly spared from it and don't have bad effects. So we can say, yes, this is a virus. Like, you know, you might tell an eight-year-old like a, like a stomach bug or like a very bad cold that you get, but this is a new virus. And lots of people are doing all we can to stop it spreading. And you are very, very safe and it's, you know, it's not going to impact your health, but it may impact on those around you. So we're going to do all we can and wash our hands and try and steer clear of people until, you know, we've dealt with that situation. When you're talking about older kids, teenagers and the like, uh, they'll be uh, very frustrated about what it might be doing to their social life. Some of the more serious ones will be deeply concerned, especially if they're getting into their, uh, their mid-teens, deeply concerned about their schooling being interrupted uh, this year. That uh, could be a level of anxiety there for kids in year 11 and 12 especially. Yes, I think that's what I'm seeing, Chris. Uh, I've actually been quite pleasantly surprised with uh, the younger kids coming through my office and even early high school children, uh, a lot of them reporting that, look, they're just sick of hearing it in the playground, but that, in fact, a lot of kids are quite, you know, jovial and joking about it. Now, if that's a good thing or not, I'm not sure, but I'm glad that they're not panicking as much as I've seen with other world events. Uh, what I am seeing, though, is, and I saw today in my clinic, is HSC students who are asking the question, what is going to happen to my HSC? And, of course, the, the reason for anxiety is that no one can answer that question yet. And all I can tell them is that many, many people are trying to come up with the best possible solutions to help everyone's health. But, of course, there are people considering things like schooling, the HSC and how this impacts on you. And, you know, you'll be the first to know once decisions are made. But in the meantime, uh, we keep going and we keep attending our lessons and we do all that we can that are, that's in our control. And often that can help children. We, we work out what do we have control over in this situation and what don't we. So let's focus on what we do have control over. We have control over practising the good hygiene, but also, you know, attending school as is per the recommendations at the moment, uh, completing our work and carrying on in that way. Um, but, yes, I mean, the HSC students at the moment I really feel for.
Just finally, Claire, more generally, I suppose, among the population, the sort of fake news and uh, that's getting around and, and, and the alarmism on, in social media. Uh, we know about social media, but why, why is this circulated? Why are people susceptible to this? Do, do, do we want to believe a conspiracy or do we want to believe the worst? Is there, is there something wrong with people sharing all this sort of information? Well, I mean, there's something wrong in the sense that it hypes the panic, doesn't it? But I also think it's a glimpse into human psychology in some ways. And I think a lot of, you know, the effects of the Conroe um, virus has been a glimpse into, you know, human behaviour and psychology, that actually when these events occur, um, it doesn't always bring out the best in humans. But I think there is some appetite there for sensationalism. I mean, we have to kind of admit that, that that is the clickbait, isn't it? That um, those headlines will get people clicking on it and reading it. So the more we use emotive language in media sources, uh, it will pull people in. And people like congregating in groups and hyping things up. And there is that kind of group effect, um, almost like Chinese whispers, if you like, that you know news goes from one to the other to the other. And whether you call that fake news, um, it's certainly exaggerated and highly emotive. And that's what gets people people talking at work around the water cooler. So um, we've got to be very, very careful that, that we don't add to that. I think it's enormously difficult. It comes straight to our phones all day, it's buzzing on our Apple watches. It's, it's to us, fed to us all day. And so we've got to be very careful. Um, again, coming back to my first, my first point of adult care of their own panicked responses, uh, that if that means shielding ourselves sometimes, sometimes from some and allowing ourselves to have one update a day, uh, that's what we need to do. Do if you need to have some time away from the current, you know, media source that's coming at you all day, every day, then do it. Great stuff, Claire. Thanks for talking to us again. Thanks, Chris.